Hey up folks, welcome to Son of Dell's live vlog on this the 14th of May. It's been seven weeks since my last vlog and a lot's been happening. Um, first of all, I've got some book reviews to do for you. I've also got some jigsaws to show you, including two of my subscription puzzles for April and May from Gibson's. I'll also be having a bit of a talk about things that have been happening in the news, etc. And also stuff that's been happening to me as well. Uh, coming up first of all, I've got the um, two, two unboxings of the subscription puzzles for April and May for the Gibson's Jigsaw subscription service. Now, what I like about the Jigsaw subscription service for Gibsons is you don't know what puzzle you're going to get and you always get it at least 30 days before it's due to buy. Now, I like the variety. Now, some people won't like these jigsaws. That's fair enough. Everybody's got their own personal tastes, but it's a bit like a mystery, you see, so you don't know what you're going to get. You know you're going to get a Gibsons jigsaw, so it's going to be wicked quality. It's going to be a really, really cool, um, uh, environmentally friendly, sustainable product. But you never know what picture you're going to get. So the first one, I actually love this one. It's very, very unusual. It's called Wandering Through Windsor by Steve Crisp. And as you can see, if I hold it up like that, it's a really clever one because it's basically a street scene like you'd see in any town centre. And you've got buskers, you've got dogs, you've got people sitting on benches, you've got old people, young people, black, white, you've got union flags going. And in the right in the distance there, you can see that. You've got Windsor Castle. Uh, and I just think it's a really nice puzzle. I really do. And like I say, it's by Steve Crisp, who's one of the artists for these. Uh, it's a thousand piece. I'm really looking forward to doing that one. Um, so the 1,000 piece jigsaw puzzle subscription for April, for April was walking, uh, sorry, wandering through Windsor by Steve Crisp. Now this one I wasn't too keen on at first until I had a real good look at the design because I'm not one for doing things with flowers and, and gardens and stuff like that. They don't really appeal to me but I could understand why this one came. It's called Garden in Bloom and it's by a woman called Janice Daughters and she's another one of the uh, people who do puzzles for Gibsons. And as you can see, like I say, it is all flowers and stuff but what makes it a bit appealing is there are lots of dogs, cats and, and all sorts of animals in it which make it a little bit more appealing to me. It's not my favourite puzzle and what was good about it is it came with, which I didn't realise was even in there at first, came with a Gibson's trolley token slash key ring. So that was my little freebie that was in it. Well that's obviously just a little extra, it's nothing major that isn't. But that Garden in Bloom by Janice Daughters now, like I said, it's not my favourite design that they've ever sent me, but it's part of the subscription service and you basically get what you pay for, which is a mystery puzzle. So all in all, in two puzzles, they're not bad at all. The first one was Wandering Through Windsor by Steve Crisp, but May's unboxing puzzle is there. And as you can see, it's called Garden in Bloom by Janice Daughters. So what's been happening since I last spoke to you? Well, we've had a few celebrity deaths, haven't we, unfortunately. Len Goodman's passed away. Um, Lily Savage, a.k.a. Paul O'Grady's passed away. Uh, Barry Humphreys has passed away, a.k.a. I can't remember the name now. Dame Edna Everidge. And we've also lost other people as well. Uh, since I last spoke to you, uh, Labour have absolutely stormed the local elections. Well, I'm Labour myself through and through, so I was over the moon with that. And it now means Blackpool is completely controlled by Labour. Hopefully they will do something because there's certain areas of Blackpool that really need some work. And obviously since I last spoke to you, we have had a new king. Which is uh, not something you'd say on every vlog, is it really? And last night we had the Eurovision, but more on that in a minute. So, the King's Coronation. Now, I'm not a royalist. I'm not one of these people who, you know, would queue out for 12 hours just to see the royal family or nothing like that. But, but, I do believe that it's something that we do need to keep. Um, people might say, yeah, but they're just privileged, blah, 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 blah. But they're not... 
they know, how can I put this? When you're born into a family, you don't know whether they're rich people, poor people, whatever. You do not know and you cannot blame each generation that's born for being a royal. You can't. You can't blame them for that because they didn't ask to be born. They didn't ask to be born a royal either. And I think when they had the coronation, which was only last week, yeah, uh, I thought it was a really good ceremony. Now, it was over the top. It was well, well, well long-winded and it could have been cut a lot shorter. And I think the thing what irritated a lot of people was the taxpayers' money paid for quite a lot of it. And I think that knocked a few people, particularly when people at the moment can hardly afford to buy food, let alone... Uh, you know pay extravagant stuff like coronations and things i know a lot of areas had like parties and celebrations and stuff we didn't round here not not in our street anyway because people are finding it tough at the moment people are finding it hard to live from week to week penny to penny and it's very difficult to justify spending that kind of money when you need it if you know what i mean it's not something where you just think well i'll just fritter it away and do this or do that you, you, you need it for your bills, you need it for your food, which is going up at an astronomical rate at the moment. I've never seen food prices go up so fast and so quick. Um, so sorry, so fast and so often. I've never seen nothing like it. Uh, but yeah, we've got a new king now. So let's see what happens. Now there's a chance, because I'm 50, there's a chance with him being, I think he's late 70s, we may see another coronation in my lifetime. We may see William being made uh, king because I know the, long, the the royals have got a history of longevity anyway and they always live into like the 90s or whatever but he was looking very frail and it's something you know that, that we, we might it might in my lifetime see another coronation which to see two in one lifetime is quite an achievement really although some places get through kings and queens faster than anything now, another thing, uh, obviously, was last night, was the Eurovision. Now, I heard our Eurovision entry about three or four weeks ago, and the first thing I said was that it's not going to come close to winning. Uh, yeah, it was a catchy enough tune, and she did her best, but there was no way in a million years that was going to do as well as last year's. No chance. Uh, Spaceman was a really, really good song. It had everybody going, the entire crowd were jumping and bouncing around and everything. This one didn't really have the same appeal, I don't think, and it showed in the in the judges viewing, uh, judges voting, and also the public voting. Now, fair dues for it to having a go at it. I think it's a brilliant, uh, you know, brilliant that they do that because a lot of them know that they're going to finish near the bottom because they're representing the UK. But good honour for actually representing the UK. It takes a lot of bottle, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I expected where we came. I thought we'd come in the bottom half, maybe bottom if we were very lucky, then just above and we came next to bottom. Some of the acts shouldn't have been on there at all. God knows how they actually got on there and finished above us. Uh, but one of the major things I thought was shocking, five years in a row now, Ireland have been voted out at the semi-final stage. Now Ireland have produced some fantastic songs. Of course, they had the record of being one of those where one guy had won twice and that was Johnny Logan. I always remember he sang a song called Hold Me Now, but I don't remember the first one or the second one. I can't remember which order they went. Now, when Matt Loreen won it last night, she's won it twice as well. So there's only a couple of people who've won it twice. Now, Ireland, I've heard some of their songs and they're brilliant. They really are. Some of their songs that should have got through to the final and they just haven't. Uh, I don't know whether it's a bias towards them or what, but there's something not quite right. Because Ireland were always a mainstay of the Eurovision Song Contest. They were somebody who got through every year without fail. In the last five years, they haven't. Um, so I think they're doing something. They, something must be going on. I don't know what it is. I can't even hazard a guess. So that's been happening in the uh, papers and stuff. And like I said, the voting, we're all Labour now in, in Blackpool. So we're all celebrating there. Me, personally, what's been happening to me? Well, a couple of weeks ago, I ended up in hospital. Um, uh, it was not last Thursday, the Thursday before. I started off with a very bad headache about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, I don't get headaches, and when I do, I usually one of my tramadol, asleep, and I'm done. Anyway, I had my tramadol. I had my two hours sleep. I woke up. Head was still throbbing. It felt like my head was caving in, and or it was like in a vice or something. It was being crushed. And I thought, well, I, I might be all right in a bit. So I sat, but then the light started affecting me really badly. 
and uh, I just couldn't get rid of it at all. Anyway, the night time came and it was probably the worst night's sleep I've had for about 20 years. I could not put my head down on the pillow because as soon as I put my head down on the pillow, pain was shooting through my skull. It was really, really bad. And uh, when I woke up the next, well, woke up, when I got up the next morning, I said to my wife, I came downstairs, I said, I need to go see somebody about this because there's something not quite right here. And I went down to Blackpool Walking Centre, who did some tests on me and found out that my coordination was knackered on my left hand side and, and bits and bobs. And they sent me up to something called the, is it special emergency daycare or something or other? Anyway, whatever it is, we went straight in and we got seen. I ended up with one of them cannula thingamajigs in my arm. And what they decided was they needed to do a CT scan on me. And they did a CT scan on me and they didn't find anything. But, but they needed to do a lump puncture on me uh, to find out what was wrong, see if there was something completely wrong or whatever. Anyway, I got into the position for do the lumbar puncture, which is the fetal position. Now, anybody who knows me knows I've got CMT, which is not a nice thing. And on, and on top of that, I've got some arthritis in my body as well. So getting into the fetal position, I thought was going to be a pain in the backside, literally. And it wasn't. I managed to get into the position and they uh, drew fluid from my spine. Now, the average, uh, sorry, what, what, what the reading should be between 10 and 15 units. Mine was 20. Now, although that isn't the highest they've had, uh, 20 was still too high. So they withdrew some fluid uh, and I got through that, no problem. The problem came when they told me that I then had to lie completely flat for two hours. I wasn't allowed to have my head lifted, a pillow under me or nothing. I had to lie completely flat on the um, couch thing and it was absolute agony because I, with having CMT, I have real bad problems with my joints anyway. Um, I have problems with my muscles and twitching and stuff and all sorts of weird wonderful stuff But this was literally bringing tears to my eyes and if my wife hadn't have been there to, co to, to comfort me and support me I would have turned over which could have been deadly because if an air bubble had got into me into me back uh, It could have killed me So, you know, I can understand why they told me I'd got to lie flat for two hours But it didn't do me any favors whatsoever. I was in so much pain. It was ridiculous it really was ridiculous and I came home on that Friday night uh, and I came home and I weren't feeling brilliant because obviously I'd been lying flat for two hours and in the night time I woke up and it was weird I was sweating from head to foot I literally had sweat pouring off me it was dripping off me and I stood up to go into the bathroom and all of a sudden the world disappeared on me. It was like, woof, everything disappeared. It was like looking down a kaleidoscope. All the colours merged together and everything. And I stumbled into the bathroom, missed the door, went straight into the bath, fell into the bath and ended up literally sitting in the bath with my legs on the outside of it. Uh, all, all my vision had completely gone at this point. And I was panicking, thinking something was going on. Anyway, my wife came running in, um, all panicky, etc., the same as me. I'd managed to turn the tap on, I don't know how I'd done that, but I'd managed to turn the tap on, so not only was I sitting in the bath, I was sitting in water. So anyway, I get out of the bath, she managed to get me out of the bath, and she's mopping me down with a towel, because literally the sweat is pouring off me, and I just didn't know what was going on, feared the worst, etc, etc. But the next day, it seemed to settle itself down, and I was okay, so now I am just waiting on an MRI scan to, basically, I think it's to give them a peace of mind if you like that there's nothing wrong but something must have happened to increase this fluid in my spine because obviously it hadn't always been like that otherwise I'd suffer with headaches all the time now the weird ass thing was when I was lying flat for two hours the, when they pulled the fluid from my spine I didn't realize within them two hours my headache went it completely disappeared and I just thought this is bizarre, I could open my eyes, I could look at the lights and everything and nothing was affecting my head. And I didn't even realise that's what these things did, you know. I didn't realise that fluid in your spine could cause this. So it was it was a bit of an eye opener to be honest with you, it really was. Um, so yeah, that happened a week, a week and a bit ago. I'm still not 100% brilliant, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm still having like bad days. Um, not with me head so much now, it's more with me stomach. Um, I seem to have... 
I don't know what it was, but for, for, for seven days, I literally felt like I'd been sick all the time and I couldn't stop it. Even if I had something nice to eat and I enjoyed it, half an hour later, I felt like I'd been sick again. Um, so that was a bit, a bit dodgy, but I'll keep you informed on that. So it hasn't exactly been a quiet bit of time, do you know what I mean? Uh, the good news is we've had some nice weather. So me, my wife, uh, Tony next door and Michelle, uh, husband and wife again, us two couples, we've been sitting out on the decking, we've been talking, we've been having coffees and, and having a good laugh and stuff like that and making the most of the nicer weather now it's come. Uh, hopefully it's nice wherever you are, I don't know whereabouts you are. Some people are in Blackpool and who watch me vlog, some people are all over the country. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's what I've been up to, really, and a lot of reading, which you're going to find out in a minute, because I've got some book reviews for you. Uh, I want to wish, actually, my um, Uncle Phil a happy birthday today, because it's his birthday today, and he also retired from work yesterday after 49 years in the job. So, uh, big, massive congratulations to him. I can't imagine working in one place for 49 years. I just can't. I just can't. I mean, I've been out of work since I was 23. 22, 23, uh, because of disabilities and stuff. So I've never known what that was like. But to stick for, for a job for 49 years, that's a massive pat on the back. And uh, I think his next job should be managing Stoke City Football Club, but we'll see. So, coming up, I've got some book reviews for you, right? First one, uh, it's a sequel book. Now, the book I read first was Mr. Mercedes, which was made into a TV series. And Stephen King, also, book two, is called Finders Keepers. Now, it's a fairly thick book, and I will say one thing. When reading Stephen King books, you've got to realise that he does go into a lot of descriptions and a lot of parts that he puts in aren't really essential to the story, but he adds them in there anyway. And I think that book could have been written 100 pages or 150 pages less than what's in it. Uh, it feels like a bit of it's like a filler more than anything. Uh, the story's good, the plot's good, the characters are good, and it's all really, really well done. It flows quite nicely, but like I said, there is quite a lot of it that didn't need to be in, I don't think, because it just didn't seem to have any resonance to the story whatsoever. Uh, now, it's called Finders Keepers, and I would give it three out of five. Um, it's a good read, don't get me wrong, it's a good read, it's a good thriller. And I'm looking forward to the last one called End of Watch, which I've also got. Uh, so that is something I'm looking forward to reading. But I can't give it any more than three out of five, because I really did. It wasn't one that I picked up and couldn't put down. I could easily put it down. I could easily put it down and go three, four days without reading any more. And I did sometimes. Um, so that book, Stephen King, Finders Keepers, I would give three out of five. Now, as a contrast, um, I read Tom Thorne books, which are Mark Billingham's detective. He's a um, DC or whatever he is. He's a DI, sorry. He's a DI, Tom Thorne. And this is book three. And as you can see, it's called Lazy Bones. And it's brilliant. It really is good. It's, it's to me, it's another four out of five. Tom Thorne thriller, without a doubt. It's really well written, the characters are fantastic, the twist in it's brilliant as well, there's twists in it. Um, he's, a, he's a human detective, he's a human policeman. He's not somebody that is, thinks he's above everything else. He, he really doesn't. He basically gets on with his job, does what he should do, doesn't do what he shouldn't do, or occasionally he'll bend the rules. He's got like a load of people who are his friends that you would not associate with policemen, but it, it's really good. It's well written again. It's a fantastic book. Good story. And four out of five. Uh, Mark Billingham, Lazy Bones, Tom Thorne Thriller. Uh, it's really good. You've got to start reading these Tom Thorne books. If you like your detective books, you've got to read these Tom Thorne books. They are absolutely amazing. And I've still got about another 16 or 17 to read. I'm pretty sure that's number three. Have I just got that right? Is that three or four? I think it might be book three. It is, it's three, I was right. Number four is called The Burning Girl, and that's the next book I think I'll be reading soon. So, Mark Billingham, Lazy Bones, four out of five. Now, my sister gets me some books every so often because uh, she gets a job lots of stuff in. Uh, her and her husband sell quite a lot of stuff, and they always look out for books for me. 
and they managed to pick me one up that I wouldn't normally have picked up and it's called Dennis Norden Clips From A Life. Now Dennis Norden is famous for things like it'll be alright on the night but behind the scenes he has done absolutely loads of comedy writing and uh, scripts for TV shows, scripts for radio shows. He has been involved in so much, him and Frank Muir between them literally. And when I read this, I read it with a bit of an open mind because I didn't know what it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like a biography. But as well as being a biography, there's also lots of funny anecdotes and funny stories. And one of the ones that jumped out at me, really jumped out at me, was when TVs first came out in the UK and they were distributed through different companies, a lot of people complained to the BBC and said that the television was heavier when people were on it than when it was switched off. Now, I just found this hilarious. I just couldn't stop laughing at this because I got this image and somebody had actually put, you can tell this is true because in the manual it says, always make sure you switch off before moving. So they'd assumed that when people were on the screen, it made the television heavier. <laughs> I still laugh about it now, it just makes me giggle. And this was of course because TV was new so people didn't know anything. But when Dennis Norden found these letters with all these complaints, it's like, wow, seriously, that's how people were? Now it's a good read, it's very, very funny. There's lots of witty stuff in there. It's a good four out of five read, it really is. Unfortunately, this one's a little bit dishevelled, a little bit stained and stuff. So if I manage to pick it up elsewhere in a charity shop, I will do, because it'll make a brilliant addition to my collection. But it's a really, really funny book. And he, and he, write, he writes it so well that you could just literally go from page to page to page they're not massive chapters some are only little tiny little bits like this little excerpts from things but he manages to capture the humor and the the basically the raw bones of entertainment in this one book and it's really really funny and i would definitely give it four out of five and it's dennis norden clips from a life now my last two book reviews they are basically a set, a set, and I read one in one day and one in two and a bit days. Now, the first book is John Chalice's Being Boise. Now, I like John Chalice, I love the character of Boise, and other than that, I'd only ever seen him in a couple of little things here and there, bit parts. But the guy was massive in theatre, he absolutely loved theatre work, he loved playing things, anything from bog-standard plays to... Uh, um, Shakespeare, anything like that. And what I like about it, it's a very frank account, very honest account about the trials and tribulations of being an actor. It doesn't just focus on the works as any, you know, oh, I've got this television job, I've got this television job. It goes through the hardships of when literally no work was coming in. Uh, and between like when Boise um, first appeared in Only Fools and Horses, they had no idea that 30 years later it was still going to be as popular, still going to be brilliant. Now, the first one covers you all the way up from his first days, all the way up to 1985 when Marlene first appeared in Only Fools and Horses. Now, it's brilliant. I, I, I'm, I, I can't say how pleased I am to buy these. I bought these second hand off um, Amazon. And even though they signed, they're not signed to me because they say, good luck, Richard, he's to you. Now, I don't care about that because at the end of the day, it's the books I've got, not, not, not the actual signatures inside. Now, like I say, the first book covers him all the way up to 1984, all through his marriages that failed and the reasons behind his failed marriages. He doesn't blame the wives. He blames both of them. He literally will take responsibility for his own shortcomings. And sometimes that's, it's really nice to see that honesty and that frankness. Now, I don't know whether you know this, but his real name is John Spurley Chalice. I know Spurley is a really funny name, but apparently some member of his family or something was a fan of a football team who had a player called Spurley. Uh, so John Chalice, book one, being Boise, to me, that is a five out of five. And I don't give fives very often. I really don't. It's a brilliant read. Really, really good read. And I read that in a day, in about six hours. I read that. I read that. And bear in mind, it's not exactly massive print either. The good thing is there's pictures in there as well, showing him growing up and, and all the stars and everything like that. 
So that one was five out of five. Now the second one is actually called Boise and Beyond. Now this covers the uh, period from 1985 up until about 2011, I think. And um, <clears throat> it deals with his famous Boise and dealing with that and basically being pigeonholed as Boise at first. Um, and it tells stories about like when he went to play other parts and they were just like, people weren't interested because they were saying, well, you're not Boise, you're not Boise. And when him and Sue Holderness uh, used to go around doing plays together, at first people expected him to be like Boise and Marlene. Well, you can't be like that if you're in a play that's set in the 1600s or something. You know, you can't, you can't be Boise and Marlene. And they, it took a while for them to literally stop people from thinking that's who they were. Uh, some people assume that because they got on so well on screen, they were married in real life. Well, they were, but not to each other. Not to each other. Now, this one, like I said, is Boise and Beyond. Now, anybody who's a massive Only Fools and Horses fan will know that John Sullivan did all the writing. And he produced the only spin-off from Only Fools and Horses called Green Green Grass, which basically starred this time. Starred. He wasn't a, uh, just a little bit part. He starred as uh, Boise and Marlene was Sue Holderness, and basically they moved to the countryside. Now, a lot of things I've learned in this book. Um, first of all, I learned that, I didn't realise this, that the Green Green Grass is filmed at a place called Wigmore Abbey, and it's actually John Chalice and his wife Carol's house. It's their own property. Um, and it, again, this tells you the story of all the different ventures he tried, all the different things and all the different charities he supported. But it also tells you about the cock-ups in his life as well, the money he invested in things which were disasters. Uh, his other marriages that went pear-shaped until he found Carol and settled with her for the rest of his life. For the last 30 years of his life, he was with Carol. Now, unfortunately, obviously, this goes up to 2011, and there won't ever be another one because he did pass away. I think he was 79 and he died of the big C. And when he went, it was it was weird watching Only Fools and Horses because I was watching it knowing that Uncle Albert was no longer with us, Grandad was no longer with us, Trigger was no longer with us, Boise was no longer with us, Mike the Barman was no longer with us, and Sid from Sid's Cafe, none of them were with us no more. They'd all passed away. And I just found it really, really bizarre to watch a TV show that when it was on, all those people were alive, you know, all of them were basically young actors and stuff like that. And to know now that literally 75% of that cast is no longer with us, it's it's quite a shock, really. And uh, I really enjoyed it again, and it's another five out of five. I can't fault these two books. If you can get hold of them, that's Big Boise and Boise and Beyond by John Chalice, and they are both five out of five reads. Now, just before I stop my book stuff, I will just like to tell you about two books I've picked up recently from charity shops in Cleveland's. Now, the first one, I really like this actor. I've got his um, biographies, but as Alan Partridge, I've not actually got his real life biography. And it's by the brilliant Steve Coogan and it's called Easily Distracted. And I managed to pick that up from a charity shop for 99 pence, believe it or not. And that's a good hardback book, that good quality. And it's, it's in good condition as well. It looks like it's only been read once. So that's a book to add to my collection, which I'm going to look forward to reading. And also, I've read everything this guy's wrote, except this one book, which is was his later book. Now, anybody who's ever watched um, The Da Vinci Code or Angels and Demons will know that Tom Hanks plays this guy who basically goes around um, through myths and legends and, and, and trying to stop people from doing stuff to do with evil and things like this. And his name is Dan Brown, the author. And this is the one book I have not actually got, and it's called Origin. And I'm really looking forward to that. And believe it or not, that was in a charity shop as well. And when you think that was only done about, I think, five years ago, something like that. Yeah, that's it. The, the, the uh, character that Tom Hanks plays is Robert Langdon. And these are all part of the Robert Langdon books, which are Angels and Demons, The Da Vinci Code, The Lost Symbol, Inferno. But he's also wrote Digital Fortress and Deception Point. And I've read them all. And he's a brilliant, brilliant author. I mean, the books are long. They are really long, but you will not be able to put them down. I couldn't. I couldn't. Uh, when I read Inferno, yeah, Inferno, it was absolutely brilliant all the way to the end. Um, and it, it, they, they just grip you, you know, and they make you think of things that are 
true to life, things that could happen behind the scenes without you even knowing they were going on. And that's what I love. So I'm really, really looking forward to reading that Dan Brown origin. Might even be my next book yet. I'm not sure. I've got about another 70 or 80 to read, so I've got plenty of time. So yeah, there was my jigsaw gallery and I've done a three or four, but I've got some new jigsaws to show you as well. Now, I had a jigsaw a while ago, which was basically all about staying positive and positivity. It was actually called the Jigsaw of Positivity. And I'm pleased to say they brought out a sequel to it. Now you might think, how can you have a sequel to a jigsaw? But if you look at this one, it's called Sparkly and Weird. And it says, what the world needs right now is the exact shape of all the sparkly and weird parts of yourself that you are holding back. It's about being true to yourself. It's with funny little cartoon pictures, life is short, be more weird and stuff like this. And it's basically about not stopping yourself from expressing yourself. Because everybody's different and everybody's creative in their own way. Whether it be how you dress, whether it be stuff you do, whether it be the music you listen to, it could be anything. But those parts of you that make you you, don't be ashamed of them. You know, be proud of them. 
that th there's nothing to hide because at the end of the day if you think about it when you work out how long you're on this planet does it really really matter what other people think about you does it really matter if people think you're weird and strange because you wear purple hair or you wear green clothes with luminous blue badges on them or whatever you do whatever you feel comfortable with and be yourself and I think if you are like that then you will enjoy your life no matter what don't let anybody stop you from being who you are it's very important it really is that's my philosophy for the day anyway that's the first jigsaw and it's called sparkly and weird and it's by Gibson's again, which is uh, one of my favourite go-to jigsaw companies. Gibson's. That's the first one. Now I had to get this because I got the one when the Queen were, was celebrating her Jubilee uh, special anniversary thing. And I knew that the King was coming into power, so I bought this one. Again, this one is off Gibson's and it was a special one that was done. And it's called Coronation of a King. And basically it's loads of pictures all showing what would happen at the coronation. How it would all go etc etc and of course there you've got like charlie when he's younger and when he's older and, and proper pictures as well they're not cartoon drawings a lot of them are proper pictures of when he was younger it's by val goldfinch which is a bird in it yeah it is uh, and again it's another gibson's one it's another special one there look so that's a gibson's jigsaw now, when I said to you I've got another one in the set, it's actually only just come out, this one has, and I fell in love with it straight away. And it's an animal version of it, and it's called Sun Bears and Sloths. Now, I've got a friend next door, Michelle, um, her, and, her and her husband, Tony, and Michelle is mad on sloths. She absolutely loves them. So when I've done this one, she's going to want to see this one completed. Again, as you can see, lots of really, really, really cool animals on there. Everything from cheetahs to lions to something I've never heard of, actually, called a quokka. Look that one up, Q-U-O-K-K-A, -A, a quokka. I've just seen a picture of it on here. I've never heard of that one. You learn something new every day, even at 50. Can you believe that? A quokka. No idea. I'll look it up after. <laughs> yeah, so there's that jigsaw, and it's called Sun Bears and Sloths. And again, it's by Val Goldfinch. Now, what I like about this is it's conserve and protect endangered animals, and it's designed in collaboration with the Zoological Society of East Anglia to try and save these species of animals that we keep eradicating at a rate of knots. Because for some reason we think that the animals don't matter, so we can just wipe out species and it won't have any bearing on us, but it will. It will, trust me. Anyway, that's the fourth jigsaw, and that's some bears and sloths. Now the last jigsaw, when we, I've just, funny enough, when I was talking earlier on, I told you about the Eurovision, and they bought out a special jigsaw, Wasgidge Mystery Puzzle, based on the Eurovision Song Contest, and I absolutely love it. Uh, and as you can see, it's Wasgid's Mystery Puzzle. Uh, you don't picture the, you, what you see there. That is not the jigsaw. The jigsaw is what will happen next. What will happen in the future? What will happen to all those characters in about five or ten minutes' time? And that's what the jigsaw is. Now, like I said, I've got loads of Wasgidges upstairs. I must have 25, 30 of them. And the brilliant puzzles, they really are. And this one is Mystery Puzzle 25. Now, I said that these are jig Gibson's jigsaws, a lot of them are. But I haven't bought them all off Gibson's. I bought them off a place called Puzzles Galore, which I'll put the link underneath. Because even though the Gibson's puzzles, they are cheaper on another site. Which I know it doesn't make much sense that, but they are cheaper. Only a pound maybe, um, but... It's still a pound, so if you're buying four or five jigsaws and you can save a pound on each one, you know, you've nearly got halfway towards another jigsaw, really. So, yeah, that one is that. It's uh, what you can see there. Wasgidge number 25. Now, one thing I saw this morning on my computer, this is my last word, if you like, and it's basically about um, people, people in general, because I saw this post on my local area uh, Facebook page thing called Next Door, and it told the story of a woman who basically uh, was asking for advice because she'd had parcels delivered to her house, and because she weren't in, they'd been left with a neighbour, and a card had been popped through a door. 
but this neighbour kept swearing that she wasn't that he wasn't receiving these parcels and it's happened before where he said he's not received them even though the post have said yes we definitely dropped it off there now i don't know where you live what it's like where i live what it's like we don't get anything like that because we've got nine ten maybe twelve places all the way up and down the street who know each other really really well and they will take in parcels they will take in everybody's parcels. Nobody's ever said that somebody's nicked one or complained that they've done something to it or whatever. And I just thought to myself, how strange that in an area that's almost literally within a stone's throw from where I live, that it can be so different compared to our area. So in one few group of streets, you've got people who don't trust each other and think they're stealing parcels. And in ours, we literally will take parcels in for people. We've had people knocking on the door before now. Uh, we wave to people that we didn't even know coming past the house. And now they start waving every time they come past. And I've been out and I've introduced me and Deb to them and they've introduced themselves to us. And we didn't even know them. And yet now we do, they're part of our community. They live at the bottom of the street. And I just think people these days, they're too suspicious. And also they're too nasty. They are too nasty. Um, you've got some people that literally want to be horrible all the time and I don't I don't get it I don't understand it maybe I missed something uh, because people say oh well you know it's because it's what they've been through when they were young. it's crap That's bullshit mate I'm sorry excuse the French it's bull I've been through absolutely ridiculous stuff in my life stuff that would literally make a lot of people just say that's it I've had enough I'm gone but I've come through it and I'm still smiling, I'm still a bloody idiot. I'm still somebody who'll make people laugh and joke at my own expense, I don't care. Why should I care? What, what the hell? What the hell? If I can, when I'm gone, if people say he was a decent lad, he, you know, I had a laugh with him, great. What I don't want to do is go, and then within about two or three years, everybody forgot me because I was a miserable git, or I was horrible to people, or I treated people like shite. I mean, don't get me wrong, not always. I've not always treated people well, I haven't. When I was younger, I was an absolute shite. I was horrible. I was a really horrible person. And I know I was a horrible person. I've admitted to being a horrible person. But for the last 30 years, maybe, 25 years, I think I've done okay. I've made lots of friends. I don't mean like hundreds of friends that come around here. I've made lots of friends. I've made people in the street. Nobody's ever seems to have fell out with me for any reason because I don't give them cause to. You know, but I'm not a yes man, I'm not a, oh yeah, I'll do that, no problem, oh yeah, yeah, I'll do that. No, 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 no. You take me as you find me. I've never tried to pretend something that I'm not. I've never had delusions of grandeur about thinking I could be a millionaire next week, you know, I'm not Derek Trotter or nothing like that. But I've, I think that that's what's important and that's what's missing in society now. Too many times I'll turn on the news and somebody's been stabbed because of an argument in the street. Somebody's had their house done over because they get upset somebody who lived next door or whatever. And I just think, wow, seriously? Seriously, that is what you want your life to be? You know, there's only you who can change it. There's only you who can change it. And people might say, oh, yeah, but it's the area you live in. No, nope. no. Nope. I was brought up in Bradley and nobody had anything there. Not a thing, literally. You were lucky if there was two cars in two streets. That's all there was. You didn't see many cars at all because people couldn't afford them. And, you know, we, we were fine. We were absolutely fine. We didn't have anything, but we just still shared it. We just still shared it with all the neighbours because that's how people were. And I like to think that this little bit of road where we live, this these couple of streets where people really, really do know each other is part of that. I'd like to think it's it's a throwback to a bygone era. But I think we just should, you know, be more friendly, if you like. Friendly. You know, just make allowances. Too many people these days, they'll see somebody walking past them, a drunk, a drunk with a bottle, and they'll go, oh yeah, right, and give them loads of grief. And I just think to myself, you don't know their story. Yeah, they might be a regular PA, they might be somebody who just likes alcohol, but they might have a story that you don't know about. They might have a history, they might have something that's driven them to how they live. You know, you don't know what's going on. They don't know your story. You don't know their story. They don't judge you. Don't judge them. Don't judge them. Don't see the point. Why judge people? I don't want to be judged. <laughs> well, you can do. You can judge me all you like, but it wouldn't make a difference. It's water off a duck's back to me. I've never been bothered about what people think about me. I just haven't. I don't see the point.
It's only going to make a difference. The only thing we know from the minute we're born is that one day we won't be here. And it's what you do in that middle bit. That bit in between, whether it be six days or 110 years, it doesn't matter. It's what you do in that bit that makes all the difference. Ah, philosopher, I don't know what's going on here. Anyway, on that note, I've done a massive vlog. I hope you all are going to enjoy this. I've enjoyed this vlog, sorry. I will definitely not be waiting seven weeks till I do another one. I've got a few things coming up, including book reviews, um, a TV show review, because we'll be finished by then, of The Sandman. We are three or four episodes in at the moment. I'll have jigsaws to show you, uh, a few items which are coming. Just before I go, I'll just tell you about two uh, books that I've pre-ordered. Now, the first one you might not be interested in because it's part of the series to do with, you know, the one I've just showed you, The Finders Keepers, along with Mr. Mercedes and End of Watch. He's also bought out a book called Holly, which tells the story of the woman who runs the agency, basically, the detective agency called Finders Keepers with Bill Hodges, who's the policeman in it. Well, retired policeman. So I've ordered that one. Now, that one you might not be interested in, but any person who loves 80s comedy will be as excited as I am because I think it's in September this year I've pre-ordered it there's a brilliant biography coming out and it's Adrian Edmondson now Aid Edmondson to me is one of the funniest dudes I've ever come across in my entire life on TV everything he's ever been in I've enjoyed even the bad comedy shows he's done I've, I've still enjoyed them because I love the way he is I love the person he is I think the way he behaves and stuff and he doesn't always want to be in the limelight, but when he is, it's usually for a fun reason, a good reason, or a charitable reason. And I am so looking forward to his biography, and my wife's got me to pre-order it. Uh, and it comes out in September. If you're interested and you want the signed edition, go on to Waterstones, because they're selling the signed edition and the unsigned edition for the same price of £22. Now, that isn't bad for a hardback book signed by Aid Edmondson himself. And it's £22 and it's on Waterstones. So if you're interested, get on there and get it ordered. You might even get it for Christmas off somebody. You never know. Anyway, on that note, you all take care. Thank you so much for being patient and for watching my vlog. And I'll do another one soon. Bye for now.